the Gospel of Luke today. I am going to actually go through. I've been doing this more and more because I want to, some of this is just to help us as we think about the Bible and how the Bible is a book and how all of it ties together. So this week I'm going to actually take the first reading from the Old Testament. I'm going to take a reading from Corinthians and I'm going to take a reading from Luke and we're going to run through this theme that Jesus is really talking about in the Gospel of Luke. I am actually getting better about being able to go through three passages and still keep it short. Um, So we're going to uh, do that uh, this morning. And as we do this, it is intentional, one, to show a running theme throughout Scripture. But I I think it's also helpful to make us more. I spent a lot of time in the Gospels. Um, that's intentional. <laughs> um, that's the, the, the life and the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. Um, but I like to interweave the others. And so it just gets us uh, more in tune to the Old Testament, how, the, how we use the Old Testament. Um, I always say this, a, a lot of the craziness of the church of Jesus Christ actually comes from an abuse of how we even read through the Old Testament. If you don't read through the Old Testament, I saw something this week that um, a, <clears throat> in part of every page of the Old Testament that you would read, you should have at the top of every page of your Bible, these things testify about Christ. If you read the Old Testament and you realize that everything testifies about Christ, it will save you a lot of craziness and heartache um, as uh, we engage the totality of Scripture. We're going to do that today. It's not going to actually be hard once I draw from the Old Testament and wrap it up uh, to begin to see how there is this story in the Old Testament about a man named Joseph, and if there's any man in the Old Testament whose whole story testifies about Christ, it is Joseph. And, um, and so we're going to start there um, as um, we, we read, and, and you know, our, our thoughts today is about this beautiful life, um, and I don't think we think about our walk with Christ in those uh, terms, or um, if we hear those terms, we 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 think a, a certain way, or uh, we can get fearful. But I, I believe that the Scripture itself is weaving um, this beautiful story and a beautiful life in a way that, um, actually, even from the words of Jesus, um, I don't know that we would think about how we would talk about the Christian, the spiritual life, um, in these kind of ways, because we're used to hearing it in many other ways. So we're going to start in the Old Testament. And so what I'm going to do with each of these is I'm going to deal with the passage and then I'll move on to the next. So I'm not going to, there's blank slides in in between. Uh, But Joseph is this guy in the Old Testament. Joseph's dad was named Jacob. And um, Jacob um, had at least 12 sons. He might have more. He had daughters as well. Um, but uh, one of these sons' name was Joseph, and Joseph is this Old Testament uh, character. Uh, he had uh, dreams, and um, he was his father's favorite. Um, his father, there, there, there's so much of the story I just I won't get into, but his father had multiple wives, and he liked, uh, he liked uh, Joseph's mom a little better than the other wife he had, and so he treated Joseph better. Um, and he had two sons by the other wife, Rachel, and he showed favoritism to both Joseph and Benjamin. And then, um, of course, if you're raised in a family of sons and one is obviously favored by the parent, this wasn't a good thing, by the way, if Jacob did. Um, but uh, it's just we get the stories, warts and all in Scripture. But his brothers resented him um, because he was the favored child. And so... Um, they got mad, and they actually were going to kill Joseph, um, but uh, one of the older brothers uh, stepped in, Reuben was his name, and instead they decided to sell Joseph into slavery and to the Egyptians, and so that's what happened. Um, they threw him in a pit, and then basically got rid of him, and then they went back and told dad, Jacob, that he had died. So Joseph thinks that Joseph, or Jacob thinks that Joseph is dead. And, um, but what happened in the story of Joseph, it's long and convoluted, but through a series of events, Joseph actually 
raises to the second most powerful place in the world at that time, which would have been Egypt. Um, and uh, next to Pharaoh, he became Pharaoh's right-hand man, and there was famine in the world. And lo and behold, if you're going to live and you're going to survive because of Joseph's wisdom, the only place you could get food was Egypt. And so as the story goes, these brothers keep going back to Egypt, and Joseph is the one delivering the food, but they don't recognize Joseph. And um, he, he recognizes his brothers immediately, and he kind of gives them a, a little bit of scenarios to work through and hard times. But we are entering the story where jo- Joseph is finally going to reveal himself to his brothers. And that's where we're at right now. And this is, I think, Genesis uh, 45. So they've come for food, and they have to keep coming back for food um, to live. And Joseph can't contain it anymore. And so Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence with right Rightfully so, right? Because now Joseph has all the power. I mean, listen, Joseph has revenge handed to him on a silver platter. He has revenge handed him on a silver platter with gravy on top. Of course, his brothers were terrified. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. You can go to the next slide. And when they had done so, he says, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Joseph will go on to say in the latter part, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Old Testament story. Joseph treated terribly, cast off, left for dead. Now in a place where he can exact revenge on the very brothers who did him wrong. And what do his brothers get? Mercy and grace. And really, on top of that, more than mercy and grace, he not only gave them mercy and grace, but he invited them to come to um, the land. And um, even when they would leave to go home, he'd fill their, 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 their bags with extra food. The gospel in Genesis. These things testify of Christ. On to Corinthians. Corinthians, uh, it's the next uh, series of slides. This is St. Paul. Um, And so St. Paul is writing. Um, I do love the book of Corinthians. It's an interesting uh, book. Um, The passage I'm going to read is very familiar uh, to us because a lot of times, and I have done this as well, um, this passage will be read at, uh, at weddings. Um, It's known as the great love chapter um, in the book of Corinthians. But one thing we really fail to miss when we pull out 1 Corinthians 13, so 1 Corinthians is a longer letter that Paul wrote, is there are like 12 chapters prior to it. There's some... um, there's some uh, stuff after it, but what Paul has done, what St. Paul has done, is he's gotten this letter from this church that he helped plant, and it's got all these kinds of problems in it, and he has spent his time answering the letter. Well, by the time you get to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, by the time you get to 1 Corinthians 13, um, Paul's kind of tired. He's kind of exhausted Uh, because he's kind of actually fed up with the Church of Christ. And um, so what we get, um, go ahead, I'm going to read it. Uh, It'll sound familiar to most of us, maybe not the first part, but if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and even if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. 
If I give all I possess, next slide, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Next slide. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily anchored. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Oh, my word. Yeah. (laughs) You can go back to the first of these slides. You kind of get a sense of Paul. No, the first uh, Corinthian slide, sorry. You, you, you get a sense from Paul of the frustration that he finally feels when he writes this great love chapter in Scripture. You get it in the first three verses. What you have, so when you give this at a wedding, 1 Corinthians 13 was not written to starry-eyed lovers. This is a royal smackdown by Paul. First Corinthians 13 was not written to starry-eyed lovers who love, cherish, and desire each other. First Corinthians 13 was written to people who cannot stand each other. It was written to people who can't stand each other. They are loveless people. There are factions in the church. They're all in territories. I follow this guy. I follow that guy. And they pit each other against each other. 1 Corinthians 13 was written to people who could not stand each other. They all wanted places of power. They all wanted places of prominence. They were taking each other to court. They were arguing with the gift of tongues. If you had the gift of tongues, you were more spiritually superior than the ones who didn't. It sounds like today, right? They're fighting over food. They're fighting over head coverings. They're fighting over celibacy. They're shameless about their bed partners. They're tearing each other apart with their piety, their goodness, and their superiority on display. And the love that never ends just was not in that church. And we see it, Paul finally says at the beginning, look, I don't care if you can speak in a thousand tongues. I don't care what kind of tongue languages you have. If you don't have love, you're nothing. I don't care if you speak in tongues. You're not spiritually superior. It's not the greater gifts. So why are you ripping it apart? I mean, that's a struggle even in our day and age. Oh, I got the gift of tongues. What's wrong with you? It's just amazing to me as we even argue in our day and age about the gift of tongues, we all have the same problem. We're always arguing that it's the greater gift, that I'm more spiritual. You're just a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. It's what it sounds like. Blah, 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 blah. Do you see what Paul's doing? He's actually making fun of it even. A resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Blah, 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 blah. If I have the gift of prophecy. All right, so maybe we just hit on the charismatics a little bit. Let's hit on us. If I have the gift of prophecy and all of this knowledge in my head and I can exegete the scripture and I can tell you what this means and I can argue from our confessions and I can really prove to you that Jesus plus nothing equals everything and how that is right and everyone else is wrong but I do not have love we are nothing If I've come to the conclusion that to be non-denominational is better than being a Presbyterian, but we do not have love, we're nothing. 
And if I have faith that can move mountains and don't have love, or nothing. Paul is so harsh here. He's saying your spiritual gifts, all of your knowledge, all of your prophetic power are worthless garbage without love. And what is love? You go to the next sign. Love is patient. Love is kind. That's why this is still appropriate. You know, I'm probably marrying two people that can't stand each other anyway, so I need to tell them this. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but always rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. I don't know. I think that's kind of a beautiful, beautiful royal smackdown. How is that? Now we come to Jesus in Luke. You got the next set of slides. We're continuing in Luke with where uh, Dennis ended up last week. He's still on a sermon in the plain. Um, And um, these are, if if these were like, this is the beautiful life. Um, This, if, if this were... Um, I actually thought about doing it today. I wondered where they ever came up with it. You know, you have, if you had a red letter edition of scriptures, it would be red letters. I thought about making like all the letters red against white background, but you know, red has also come to me as like red is what you get when you get corrected and um, it seems like it's like red could be screaming at us. I, I don't know that that was, I know that it wasn't Jesus' intention, but these are Jesus' words. And I think we don't uh, think about them much. We always want to live the spiritual life. We always want to live the beautiful um, life. We we always want to know what it uh, maybe uh, looks like to be holy. It's a term that's used in the church and and probably um, misused um, um, in the church because we create holiness or we create, and I would say this even about what we're about to read, we say that ho- we act like holiness is something that like we achieve in the Christian life. I mean, you can read all the pages of Scripture and you will never see that holiness is something that you achieve. It's not an achievement, it's a gift. And it's a gift given to us a God because if it's an achievement, then we have factions and fighting. That's, I mean, you go back to whatever. Book of Corinthians, that's what he was saying. You have one spirit, and the spirit distributes however he wants. Um, but if, if holiness is achievement, then we'll fight with each other. Because holiness is of achievement. If it's an achievement, then I could be more achieved than you, right? But if it's a gift, it is. And so even as we read this, I think it's important to know that even in the original language, this is written not as a prescription for the beautiful life. It's not written as a prescription of of, um, the spiritual life. It's not something that Jesus is writing on a prescription for you to take home and for you to do and, and whatever. It is a description of what the beautiful life is. It's just a fact This is what the beautiful life is. There's a big difference between it being a prescription and a description. But to you who are listening, I say, here's the beautiful life. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes 
what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect payment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. That's now the second time he said it. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgiven, you will be forgiven. Like holy Jesus, literally. That's the beautiful life. Wait, who thinks that message is really going to sell? Well... It didn't sell too well for Jesus because he got hung on a cross. Don't judge. I mean, we live in a world gone mad. Again, these are Jesus' words, so I'm, I'm not making this up. It's red letters. I think we spend most of our days prosecuting and began to think about this this week. Why is it, you know, we, we actually, it's like we only think we matter by how much we love something or how much we hate something. And since that's how we get our identity, we've gone stark, raving mad on what we love and what we hate. I haven't played it yet, but there's like this new game called Wordle. Like, the, it's, like it's a one-word thing. I mean, it's meant to be whatever. It's only one word a day, so you can't get addicted to it. But it's all over the internet. It's just, it's cute. It's whatever. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. But guess what we have? We have people who love Wordle, and we have people who hate Wordle. <laughs> because we can't help ourselves. I find my identity in the people who hate Wordle. <laughs> it's an internet game. Five letters. You just got to figure it out. We prosecute, we judge, we declare people guilty. And Jesus says, do not judge. This is somewhat descriptive and you will not be judged. You know, you know, you, you find, if you find someone who's extremely critical of you, what's, what's our natural reaction? Is to turn and judge them back, right? Paul actually says that in Galatians. Like, if you want to live by the law, well, good luck. <laughs> because we can't even, I've always said this, if we ourselves could create our own Ten Commandments to get to heaven, we wouldn't even keep our own Ten Commandments. <laughs> Next week, and I don't know how much I'll get into it, one of the reasons he says, do not be judged and you will... Do not judge and you will not be judged. As he's going to say, you know why? One reason, you know, he gives two reasons why you don't do it. One, you don't have the authority to do it. And two, you're not good at it. No one's good at it. 
It's what he actually tries to tell. He t- Jesus tells a parable in the Gospels about the wheat and the tares and how in the kingdom of God the wheat and the tares grow together. And because wheat and tares and the good and the bad sometimes both hang out in the church of Jesus Christ because we have to find our identity and who's good or bad, what do we do? We try to figure out who the bad people are and who are the good people are. And then we try to kick the bad people out of the church. And Jesus like literally says in the parable, don't do that because you don't know what you're doing because you think you're taking out bad people, but when you take out bad people, you take out good people with you. And so what does he say? You just leave that to me. It's none of your business. None of your business. It's my business. We're no good at it. Why is this the beautiful life? Because the graceless life always leads to resentment. I know because I've lived it, and to a certain extent, I still have moments where I lived it. To be judgmental, to be the prosecutor, to be declaring people right and wrong is not only exhausting, it's miserable and it's depressing. Oh, maybe we get a good feel for it, you know, when when we do it or when we say that word or when we uh, take someone out, Um, but it builds and builds, and it's not beautiful. It's miserable, it's depressing and exhausting, it's resentment, and you know what? When I judge and when we judge, we're actually never satisfied. We are never, ever satisfied. We are never satisfied because there's always someone else to judge. Maybe even the person we are judging keeps making a comeback, you know. We're never satisfied because we never feel like we punish someone else enough for what they have done to us or someone or to others. It's not the beautiful life. So Jesus comes along and offers a different life. And tells us that loving our enemies is the way of freedom. It's not a beautiful life to have your life carried on by revenge. And you know it. You're always angry. We're always angry. I love the first part of this. What's the answer to it? How can I not judge? How can I not condemn? How can I forgive? How can I be merciful? And Jesus actually tells us in the passage, you know how you're merciful? When you reconnect. Well, that's a, I had my alarm set this morning, so I'm thinking, oh my word. If someone did that, it's 10 o'clock, so they're telling me it's time to be done. So I don't know who smart person did that. (laughs) But where do we get our mercy? When we reconnect to the God who's merciful. Guess what the prescription is to the beautiful life? Reconnecting to the God of grace, the God of mercy, the God of love, and the God of forgiveness. I'm not very merciful. What do I need? I need to reconnect to the Father of mercy. It's just always Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Reconnect with Jesus. Three stories. Joseph, betrayed by his brothers. Who's our brother? Jesus. We betrayed him this week. Every time we fall short of the glory of God. We hand 
Jesus every day revenge on a silver platter and he forgives us and he loves us. Joseph was numbered with the transgressors when he was in prison. Joseph was raised to the most powerful place on earth and instead of using it for his power and authority and revenge, he used it for love just like Jesus. You can go to Paul's passage in 1 Corinthians, and we can read, love is patient, love is kind. And then by the end of it, like, who can love like that? We'll do this again. Go home and read 1 Corinthians 13. And instead of putting the word love in there, put the word Jesus. Jesus is kind. Jesus is patient. Jesus keeps no record of wrong. Jesus is the one who is long-suffering. Jesus never fails. Reconnect to Jesus. Fall in love with Jesus tonight. And then you come to this, who loved his enemies. Jesus says that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Who was the one who was wrongfully treated? Who prayed for those who persecuted him? Who prayed for those who wrongfully treated him? His name was Jesus. Genesis, Corinthians, Luke. It is all about a beautiful Jesus. It's not just a beautiful life. Our beautiful life is a beautiful Jesus. A beautiful church is a beautiful Jesus. Because Jesus is Genesis. Jesus is Corinthians. And Jesus is Luke. Because Jesus plus nothing equals everything go through all of these passages and you will find Jesus at the heart of every one of them from Genesis to Luke to Corinthians so we love Jesus And whether it's a crummy church in Corinth, whether it's to clueless disciples, whether it's to a mess of a family in Genesis, God always can be found in the mess because that's where Jesus is. And thank goodness for that. You find Jesus in the mess of a family in Genesis. You find Jesus in one mess of a church in Corinth. And you will find Jesus as it goes to the cross coming to one mess of the world with the message of the beautiful life. And you might say, I can't love my enemies and my love isn't very patient and my love isn't very kind and God knows I keep a record of wrong. I've got a score sheet got a score sheet for my wife. I've got a score sheet for my kids. I've got a score sheet for my church. And all of that has ever led me is to misery. And you may feel like it's difficult, but you are connected to the one who has perfectly loved you, perfectly patient with you, and he's perfectly kind with you. And his name is Jesus. And he is the beautiful life. And he is the beautiful person. And he is our beautiful, beautiful Savior. You know what the Christian beautiful life is? It's just falling in love with Jesus. It's my heart myself and for us so he gives us a beautiful table of his beautiful body and his beautiful blood broken and shed for you you once were enemies now you're seated at his table Jesus thank you who's this table for It's for those of us who were enemies of God that he loved and he gave himself for. He knew he would struggle with it up, so he says, you know what? I've got a beautiful table with a beautiful body and a beautiful blood, and you're going to do this till I come again. 
to remind yourselves of this beautiful life, of this beautiful person, and our longings to be that beautiful church. I mean, wouldn't it be great if someone asked you where you went to church? Oh, I go to Nature Coast Church. Oh, that's that place where they love their enemies. That's that place where they just show grace to people who don't deserve. That's that place where they're very kind and they're patient. That's that church that keeps no record of wrong. Oh, my God, in the right sense, okay? You know, people always say, I can't say, oh, my God. I think I can say, oh, my God, when you really say, oh, my God. He's the one that keeps no record of wrongs. I mean, could you imagine being the church that keeps no record of wrongs and is patient and kind because we have a Jesus who keeps no record of our wrongs as far as the east is from the west. He remembers our sins no more. So come, come to this table. It's an ocean of his love and of his grace. Go back to the slide, spirit, take me, just lead me where my trust is without borders. I was sitting down and Rick comes back from taking communion. He says, that love thing, it like kicks me. <laughs> I mean, who really can love their enemies? Who truly has a love that is patient and kind? And what, more importantly, does that look like? I mean, are you crazy foolish, Jesus? Maybe we're just asking the Spirit to lead us where our trust doesn't have any borders. And you go to the next slide. Let me walk upon waters wherever you would call me if it's to love my enemies. It's to not judge. It's to be merciful. It's to forgive. Then we just sang after that, take me deeper than my feet were ever wander. Listen, Jesus, in his words today, Paul and Corinthians, Joseph are taking our feet deeper than we could ever hope to wander, ever hope to understand, ever hope to trust in our relationships that something as foolish as what Jesus said today can actually be the beautiful life. So as we leave today, we do ask that the Spirit take us to a place of trust that just doesn't have any borders. And then they go to the next slide. Then our faith will be made stronger in the presence of our Savior. It's the beautiful life. It's the beautiful Jesus who could make the beautiful church. Go in peace. Amen.